Eugenie Grandet by Honoré de Balzac. Section 1. There are houses in certain provincial towns whose aspect inspires melancholy, akin to that called forth by sombre cloisters, dreary moorlands, or the desolation of ruins. Within these houses there is, perhaps, the silence of the cloister, the barrenness of moors, the skeleton of ruins. Life and movement are so stagnant there that a stranger might think them uninhabited, were it not that he encounters suddenly the pale, cold glance of a motionless person whose half-monastic face peers beyond the window-casing at the sound of an unaccustomed step such elements of sadness formed the physiognomy as it were of a dwelling-house in saumur which stands at the end of the steep street leading to the chateau in the upper part of the town this street now little frequented hot in summer cold in winter dark in certain sections is remarkable for the resonance of its little pebbly pavement always clean and dry for the narrowness of its tortuous roadway for the peaceful stillness of its houses which belong to the old town and are overtopped by the ramparts houses three centuries old are still solid though built of wood and their diverse aspects add to the originality which commends this portion of saumur to the attention of artists and antiquaries it is difficult to pass these houses without admiring the enormous oaken beams their ends carved into fantastic figures which crown with a black bas-relief the lower floor of most of them in one place these transverse timbers are covered with slate and mark a bluish line along the frail wall of a dwelling covered by a roof en colombage which bends beneath the weight of years and whose rotting shingles are twisted by the alternate action of sun and rain in another place blackened worn-out window-sills with delicate sculptures now scarcely discernible seem too weak to bear the brown clay pots from which springs the heart's ease or the rose-bush of some poor working-woman farther on are doors studded with enormous nails where the genius of our forefathers has traced domestic hieroglyphics of which the meaning is now lost for ever here a protestant attested his belief there a leaguer cursed henry the fourth elsewhere some bourgeois has carved the insignia of his noblesse de cloche symbols of his long-forgotten magisterial glory the whole history of france is there next to a tottering house with roughly plastered walls where an artisan enshrines his tools rises the mansion of a country gentleman on the stone arch of which above the door vestiges of armorial bearings may still be seen battered by the many revolutions that have shaken france since seventeen eighty nine in this hilly street the ground floors of the merchants are neither shops nor warehouses lovers of the middle ages will here find the ouvrier of our forefathers in all its native simplicity these low rooms which have no shop frontage no shop windows in fact no glass at all are deep and dark and without interior or exterior decoration their doors open in two parts each roughly iron-bound the upper half is fastened back within the room the lower half fitted with a spring bell swings continually to and fro air and light reach the damp den within either through the upper half of the door or through an open space between the ceiling and the low front wall breast high which is closed by solid shutters that are taken down every morning put up every evening and held in place by heavy iron bars this wall serves as a counter for the merchandise no delusive display is there only samples of the business whatever it may chance to be such for instance as three or four tubs full of codfish and salt a few bundles of sailcloth cordage copper wire hanging from the joists above iron hoops for casks ranged along the wall or a few pieces of cloth upon the shelves enter a neat girl glowing with youth wearing a white kerchief her arms red and bare drops her knitting and calls her father or her mother one of whom comes forward and sells you what you want phlegmatically civilly or arrogantly according to his or her individual character whether it be a matter of two sous or twenty thousand francs worth of merchandise you may see a cooper for instance sitting in his doorway and twirling his thumbs as he talks with a neighbor 
to all appearance he owns nothing more than a few miserable boat ribs and two or three bundles of laths but below in the port his teeming woodyard supplies all the cooperage trade of anjou he knows to a plank how many casks are needed if the vintage is good a hot season makes him rich a rainy season ruins him in a single morning puncheons worth eleven francs have been known to drop to six in this country as in touraine atmospheric vicissitudes control commercial life wine-growers proprietors wood-merchants coopers innkeepers mariners all keep watch of the sun they tremble when they go to bed lest they should hear in the morning of a frost in the night they dread rain wind drought and want water heat and clouds to suit their fancy a perpetual duel goes on between the heavens and their terrestrial interests the barometer smooths saddens or makes merry their countenances turn and turn about from end to end of the street formerly the grand rue de saumur the words here's golden weather are passed from door to door or each man calls to his neighbor it rains louis knowing well what a sunbeam or the opportune rainfall is bringing him on saturdays after midday in the fine season not one sou's worth of merchandise can be bought from these worthy traders each has his vineyard his enclosure of fields and all spend two days in the country this being foreseen and purchases sales and profits provided for the merchants have ten or twelve hours to spend in parties of pleasure in making observations in criticisms and in continual spying a housewife cannot buy a partridge without the neighbors asking the husband if it were cooked to a turn a young girl never puts her head near a window that she is not seen by idling groups in the street consciences are held in the light and the houses dark silent impenetrable as they seem hide no mysteries life is almost wholly in the open air every household sits at its own threshold breakfasts dines and quarrels there no one can pass along the street without being examined in fact formerly when a stranger entered a provincial town he was bantered and made game of from door to door from this came many good stories and the nickname copieux which was applied to the inhabitants of angers who excelled in such urban sarcasms the ancient mansions of the old town of saumur are at the top of this hilly street and were formerly occupied by the nobility of the neighborhood the melancholy dwelling where the events of the following history took place is one of these mansions venerable relics of a century in which men and things bore the characteristics of simplicity which french manners and customs are losing day by day follow the windings of the picturesque thoroughfare whose irregularities awaken recollections that plunge the mind mechanically into reverie and you will see a somewhat dark recess in the centre of which is hidden the door of the house of m grandet it is impossible to understand the force of this provincial expression the house of m grandet without giving the biography of m grandet himself m grandet enjoyed a reputation in saumur whose causes and effects can never be fully understood by those who have not at one time or another lived in the provinces in seventeen eighty nine Monsieur grandet still called by certain persons le père grandet though the number of such old persons has perceptibly diminished was a master cooper able to read write and cipher at the period when the french republic offered for sale the church property in the arrondissement of saumur the cooper then forty years of age had just married the daughter of a rich wood merchant supplied with the ready money of his own fortune and his wife's dough in all about two thousand louis d'or grandet went to the newly established district where with the help of two hundred double louis given by his father-in-law to the surly republican who presided over the sales of the national domain he obtained for a song legally if not legitimately one of the finest vineyards in the arrondissement 
an old abbey, and several farms. The inhabitants of Saumur were so little revolutionary that they thought Père Grandet a bold man, a republican, and a patriot with a mind open to all the new ideas, though in point of fact it was open only to vineyards. He was appointed a member of the administration of Saumur, and his pacific influence made itself felt politically and commercially. Politically, he protected the ci devant nobles, and prevented, to the extent of his power, the sale of the lands and property of the emigre. Commercially, he furnished the republican armies with two or three thousand puncheons of white wine, and took his pay in splendid fields belonging to a community of women whose lands had been reserved for the last lot. Under the consulate, Grandet became mayor, governed wisely, and harvested still better pickings. Under the empire he was called Monsieur Grandet. Napoleon, however, did not like republicans, and superseded Monsieur Grandet, who was supposed to have worn the Phrygian cap, by a man of his own surroundings, a future baron of the empire. Monsieur Grandet quitted office without regret. He had constructed, in the interests of the town, certain fine roads which led to his own property. His house and lands, very advantageously assessed, paid moderate taxes, and since the registration of his various estates, the vineyards, thanks to his constant care, had become the head of the country, a local term used to denote those that produced the finest quality of wine he might have asked for the cross of the legion of honor this event occurred in eighteen hundred and six m grandet was then fifty-seven years of age his wife thirty-six and an only daughter the fruit of their legitimate love was ten years old m grandet whom providence no doubt desired to compensate for the loss of his municipal honors inherited three fortunes in the course of this year that of madame de la Godinière, born de la bertellière the mother of madame grandet that of old monsieur de la bertellière her grandfather and lastly that of madame gentillet her grandmother on the mother's side three inheritances whose amount was not known to any one the avarice of the deceased persons was so keen that for a long time they had hoarded their money for the pleasure of secretly looking at it old m de la bertelliere called an investment an extravagance and thought he got better interest from the sight of his gold than from the profits of usury the inhabitants of saumur consequently estimated his savings according to the revenues of the son's wealth as they said m grandet thus obtained that modern title of nobility which our mania for equality can never rub out he became the most imposing personage in the arrondissement he worked a hundred acres of vineyard which in fruitful years yielded seven or eight hundred hogsheads of wine he owned thirteen farms an old abbey whose windows and arches he had walled up for the sake of economy a measure which preserved them also a hundred and twenty-seven acres of meadow-land where three thousand poplars planted in seventeen ninety three grew and flourished and finally the house in which he lived such was his visible estate as to his other property only two persons could give even a vague guess at its value one was m cruchot a notary employed in the usurious investments of m grandet the other was M. des Grassins, the richest banker in Saumur, in whose profits Grandet had a certain covenanted and secret share. Although old Cruchot and M. des Grassins were both gifted with the deep discretion which wealth and trust beget in the provinces, they publicly testified so much respect to M. Grandet that observers estimated the amount of his property by the obsequious attention which they bestowed upon him. In all Saumur there was no one not persuaded that M. Grandet had a private treasure, some hiding-place full of Louis, where he nightly took ineffable delight in gazing upon great masses of gold 
avaricious people gathered proof of this when they looked at the eyes of the good man to which the yellow metal seemed to have conveyed its tints the glance of a man accustomed to draw enormous interest from his capital acquires like that of the libertine the gambler or the sycophant certain indefinable habits furtive eager mysterious movements which never escape the notice of his co-religionists this secret language is in a certain way the freemasonry of the passions m grandet inspired the respectful esteem due to one who owed no man anything who skilful cooper and experienced wine-grower that he was guessed with the precision of an astronomer whether he ought to manufacture a thousand puncheons for his vintage or only five hundred who never failed in any speculation and always had casks for sale when casks were worth more than the commodity that filled them who could store his whole vintage in his cellars and bide his time to put the puncheons on the market at two hundred francs when the little proprietors had been forced to sell theirs for five louis his famous vintage of eighteen eleven judiciously stored and slowly disposed of brought him in more than two hundred and forty thousand francs financially speaking m grandet was something between a tiger and a boa constrictor he could crouch and lie low watch his prey a long while spring upon it open his jaws swallow a mass of louis and then rest tranquilly like a snake in process of digestion impassable methodical and cold no one saw him pass without a feeling of admiration mingled with respect and fear had not every man in saumur felt the rending of those polished steel claws for this one maitre cruchot had procured the money required for the purchase of a domain but at eleven per cent for that one m des grassins discounted bills of exchange but at a frightful deduction of interest few days ever passed that m grandet's name was not mentioned either in the markets or in social conversations at the evening gatherings to some the fortune of the old wine-grower was an object of patriotic pride more than one merchant more than one innkeeper said to strangers with a certain complacency monsieur we have two or three millionaire establishments but as for m grandet he does not himself know how much he is worth in eighteen sixteen the best reckoners in saumur estimated the landed property of the worthy man at nearly four millions but as on an average he had made yearly from seventeen ninety three to eighteen seventeen a hundred thousand francs out of that property it was fair to presume that he possessed in actual money a sum nearly equal to the value of his estate so that when after a game of boston or an evening discussion on the matter of vines the talk fell upon m grandet knowing people said le pere grandet le pere grandet must have at least five or six millions you are cleverer than i am i have never been able to find out the amount answered m cruchot or m des grassins when either chanced to overhear the remark if some parisian mentioned rothschild or m lafitte the people of saumur asked if he were as rich as m grandet when the parisian with a smile tossed them a disdainful affirmative they looked at each other and shook their heads with an incredulous air so large a fortune covered with a golden mantle all the actions of this man if in early days some peculiarities of his life gave occasion for laughter or ridicule laughter and ridicule had long since died away his least important actions had the authority of results repeatedly shown his speech his clothing his gestures the blinking of his eyes were law to the countryside where every one after studying him as a naturalist studies the result of instinct in the lower animals had come to understand the deep mute wisdom of his slightest actions it will be a hard winter said one pere grandet has put on his fur gloves pere grandet is buying quantities of staves there will be plenty of wine this year m grandet never bought either bread or meat 
his farmers supplied him weekly with a sufficiency of capons chickens eggs butter and his tithe of wheat he owned a mill and the tenant was bound over and above his rent to take a certain quantity of grain and return him the flour and bran la grande nanon his only servant though she was no longer young baked the bread of the household herself every saturday m grandet arranged with kitchen gardeners who were his tenants to supply him with vegetables as to fruits he gathered such quantities that he sold the greater part in the market his firewood was cut from his own hedgerows or taken from the half-rotten old sheds which he built at the corners of his fields and whose planks the farmers carted into town for him all cut up and obligingly stacked in his woodhouse receiving in return his thanks his only known expenditures were for the consecrated bread the clothing of his wife and daughter the hire of their chairs in church the wages of la grande nanon the tinning of the saucepans lights taxes repairs on his buildings and the costs of his various industries he had six hundred acres of woodland lately purchased which he induced a neighbor's keeper to watch under the promise of an indemnity after the acquisition of this property he ate game for the first time m grandet's manners were very simple he spoke little he usually expressed his meaning by short sententious phrases uttered in a soft voice after the revolution the epoch at which he first came into notice the good man stuttered in a wearisome way as soon as he was required to speak at length or to maintain an argument this stammering the incoherence of his language the flux of words in which he drowned his thought his apparent lack of logic attributed to defects of education were in reality assumed and will be sufficiently explained by certain events in the following history four sentences precise as algebraic formulas sufficed him usually to grasp and solve all difficulties of life and commerce i don't know i cannot i will not i will see about it he never said yes or no and never committed himself to writing if people talked to him he listened coldly holding his chin in his right hand and resting his right elbow in the back of his left hand forming in his own mind opinions on all matters from which he never receded he reflected long before making any business agreement when his opponent after careful conversation avowed the secret of his own purposes confident that he had secured his listener's assent grandet answered i can decide nothing without consulting my wife his wife whom he had reduced to a state of helpless slavery was a useful screen to him in business he went nowhere among friends he neither gave nor accepted dinners he made no stir or noise seeming to economize in everything even movement he never disturbed or disarranged the things of other people out of respect for the rights of property nevertheless in spite of his soft voice in spite of his circumspect bearing the language and habits of a coarse nature came to the surface especially in his own home where he controlled himself less than elsewhere physically grandet was a man five feet high thick-set square-built with calves twelve inches in circumference knotted knee-joints and broad shoulders his face was round tanned and pitted by the smallpox his chin was straight his lips had no curves his teeth were white his eyes had that calm devouring expression which people attribute to the basilisk his forehead full of transverse wrinkles was not without certain significant protuberances his yellow-grayish hair was said to be silver and gold by certain young people who did not realize the impropriety of making a jest about m grandet his nose thick at the end bore a veined wen which the common people said not without reason was full of malice the whole countenance showed a dangerous cunning an integrity without warmth 
the egotism of a man long used to concentrate every feeling upon the enjoyments of avarice and upon the only human being who was anything whatever to him his daughter and sole heiress eugenie attitude manners bearing everything about him in short testified to that belief in himself which the habit of succeeding in all enterprises never fails to give to a man thus though his manners were unctuous and soft outwardly monsieur grandet's nature was of iron his dress never varied and those who saw him to-day saw him such as he had been since seventeen ninety one his stout shoes were tied with leathern thongs he wore in all weathers thick woollen stockings short breeches of coarse maroon cloth with silver buckles a velvet waistcoat in alternate stripes of yellow and puce buttoned squarely a large maroon coat with wide flaps a black cravat and a quaker's hat his gloves thick as those of a gendarme lasted him twenty months to preserve them he always laid them methodically on the brim of his hat in one particular spot saumur knew nothing further about this personage only six individuals had a right of entrance to monsieur grandet's house the most important of the first three was a nephew of monsieur cruchot since his appointment as president of the civil courts of saumur this young man had added the name of bonfon to that of cruchot he now signed himself c de bonfon any litigant so ill-advised as to call him monsieur cruchot would soon be made to feel his folly in court the magistrate protected those who called him monsieur le president but he favored with gracious smiles those who addressed him as monsieur de bonfon Monsieur le Président was thirty-three years old and possessed the estate of Bonfon, Bonti Fonti, worth seven thousand francs a year. He expected to inherit the property of his uncle the notary and that of another uncle, the Abbé Cruchot, a dignitary of the chapter of Saint-Martin de Tours, both of whom were thought to be very rich. These three Cruchots, backed by a goodly number of cousins and allied to twenty families in the town formed a party like the medici in florence like the medici the cruchots had their patsy madame des grassins mother of a son twenty-three years of age came assiduously to play cards with madame grandet hoping to marry her dear adolphe to mademoiselle eugenie Monsieur des Grassins, the banker, vigorously promoted the schemes of his wife by means of secret services constantly rendered to the old miser, and always arrived in time upon the field of battle. The three des Grassins, likewise, had their adherents, their cousins, their faithful allies. On the Cruchot side, the abbé, the talleyrand of the family, well backed up by his brother the notary, sharply contested every inch of ground with his female adversary and tried to obtain the rich heiress for his nephew the president this secret warfare between the cruchots and the des grassins the prize thereof being the hand in marriage of eugenie grandet kept the various social circles of saumur in violent agitation would mademoiselle grandet marry monsieur le president or monsieur adolphe des grassins to this problem some replied that monsieur grandet would never give his daughter to the one or to the other the old cooper eaten up with ambition was looking they said for a peer of france to whom an income of three hundred thousand francs would make all the past present and future casks of the grandets acceptable others replied that monsieur and madame des grassins were nobles and exceedingly rich that adolphe was a personable young fellow and that unless the old man had a nephew of the pope at his beck and call such a suitable alliance ought to satisfy a man who came from nothing a man whom saumur remembered with an adze in his hand and who had moreover worn the bonnet rouge certain wise heads called attention to the fact that m cruchot de bonfons had the right of entry to the house at all times whereas his rival was received only on sundays 
others however maintained that madame des grassins was more intimate with the women of the house of grandet than the cruchots were and could put into their minds certain ideas which would lead sooner or later to success to this the former retorted that the abbe cruchot was the most insinuating man in the world pit a woman against a monk and the struggle was even it is diamond cut diamond said a saumur wit the oldest inhabitants wiser than their fellows declared that the grandets knew better than to let the property go out of the family and that mademoiselle eugenie grandet of saumur would be married to the son of monsieur grandet of paris a wealthy wholesale wine merchant to this the cruchotines and the grassinists replied in the first place the two brothers have seen each other only twice in thirty years and next monsieur grandet of paris has ambitious designs for his son he is mayor of an arrondissement a deputy colonel of the national guard judge in the commercial courts he disowns the grandets of saumur and means to ally himself with some ducal family ducal under favor of napoleon in short was there anything not said of an heiress who was talked of through a circumference of fifty miles and even in the public conveyances from angers to blois inclusively at the beginning of eighteen eleven the cruchotines won a signal advantage over the grassinists the estate of froidfond remarkable for its park its mansion its farms streams ponds forests and worth about three millions was put up for sale by the young marquis de froidfond who was obliged to liquidate his possessions maitre cruchot the president and the abbe aided by their adherents were able to prevent the sale of the estate in little lots the notary concluded a bargain with the young man for the whole property payable in gold persuading him that suits without number would have to be brought against the purchasers of small lots before he could get the money for them it was better therefore to sell the whole to monsieur grandet who was solvent and able to pay for the estate in ready money the fine marquisate of froidfond was accordingly conveyed down the gullet of monsieur grandet who to the great astonishment of saumur paid for it under proper discount with the usual formalities this affair echoed from nantes to orleans monsieur grandet took advantage of a cart returning by way of froidfond to go and see his chateau having cast a master's eye over the whole property he returned to saumur satisfied that he had invested his money at five per cent and seized by the stupendous thought of extending and increasing the marquisate of froidfond by concentrating all his property there then to fill up his coffers now nearly empty he resolved to thin out his woods and his forests and to sell off the poplars in the meadows End of section 1